All right. Let's go ahead and get started. Thank you all so much for saying hello in the chat box. We're really excited to be here with you today um, to have this conversation. We're really excited to introduce to you our panelists for today. And so I'm going to kick us off by running through a couple of introductory slides before we dig into our conversation. All right, so introductions. I am not the great Cameron Sheedy. She is on the line with us, but we have run into some technology issues. And so in the spirit of teamwork makes the dream work, I'm going to be assisting with our intro slides today. But Cameron is an important part of our team and she's one of our research coordinators and is really responsible for helping to get this webinar going each month. Um, as we get started, I'm gonna ask folks if you could introduce yourselves again, if you have already, but also if you haven't yet, Introduce yourself by name, your role, and location. We would also love to hear from you. Why is this topic on strength-based holistic approaches to youth mental health important to you? While folks are starting to introduce themselves, I'll introduce myself. My name is Dr. Britt Patterson. I am an assistant professor at the University of Maryland School of Medicine and faculty with the National Center for School Mental Health. And it's my great privilege to be a part of this virtual learning series team. In terms of tech support, we've already received the question, but slides and, and the recording will be posted in about one week at the website listed there, schoolmentalhealth.org slash webinars. Um, so to type questions throughout our conversation today, please use the Q&A box. We will use time at the end, um, depending on how much time we have, to talk with Dr. Abdul Adil a little bit more, but please feel free to use the Q&A box if you have specific questions for our panelists. You can also message us, the hosts and panelists in the chat box if you need tech support, and then message everyone like you all are right now to share resources or provide general commentary as we are moving through the discussion. Please note, CE credits are not available for the series, but certificates of attendance are. To receive a certificate of attendance, here are the steps, okay? So you have to, at the very end, complete the post-event evaluation. You'll be re redirected to a certificate request form where you will submit your name and email address. And then you'll have to give it some time, but expect to receive your certificate in 30 to 40 days after the webinar. And some important notes, you must attend at least 50% of the webinar in real time. So we appreciate the folks who are coming in afterward to watch the recording. Unfortunately, you won't be able to receive a certificate of attendance, but we thank you for taking time to learn from the content of the session. Um, your Zoom name must match the name on your registration form. So if you're in attendance today, please change your Zoom name to match the registration form. And then if you're calling in, please use the email listed here. Um, it's Cameron Sheedy's email and confirm your phone number so that we can connect your name to your registration. And then to access the evaluation, use any code you are comfortable with. Some instructions are right there on the right and the instructions will also be available after this webinar today. All right, so we're thrilled to lead this work in collaboration with the Dania Institute. You see their leadership on the left side and the University of Maryland, our leadership here on the right. It is an exciting webinar series and we're just thrilled to have the opportunity to do this work together. You'll see here on the page, I'm gonna move quickly through this so we can get into the content for today, but you'll see on the left, some of the core actions of the Central East Mental Health Technology Tr Transfer Center Network. And on the right, you see an image of their areas of focus. So what states are included in the Central East? And similarly, we have missions for the National Center for School Mental Health um, and some of the goals of the work, which are led by a lot of the faculty you see below, as well as an amazing staff um, that includes 50 plus individuals. And as we move in, into our discussion, we just want to make it clear that the work that we do is from a lens and commitment to social and racial justice. Um, we will be having conversations about cultural responsiveness and equity, and we do the work in hopes of developing and modeling equitable and anti-racist policies and practices. It is our commitment that in these conversations and in conversations outside of this space, that we are all learners, healing, growing together. And so as we, embark on this conversation, please know that each and every one of you is valued and we'll be asking for your thoughts and perspectives because it helps us to better understand um, the 
content that we're discussing today, but helps to also give voice um, in a representative way to some of the topics that we're considering. So we appreciate your expertise in advance and please do dialogue with us today and beyond. In terms of upcoming events, we do host this virtual learning series one Tuesday each month. So it's the second Tuesday each month from 3 to 4 p.m. You can access the um, website below to register for our upcoming sessions. And if you are interested in being a part of a learning community focused on promoting school well-being, please know we have received a number of applications, but the deadline is this Friday. So if you're interested in talking more about school well-being, please scan the QR code there or send an email again to Cameron Sheedy. All right, this is where we get to dig in. So the objectives for today's session include the following. We want to be able to lead this space, identifying approaches to helping youth recognize and utilize their strengths, identify strategies to engage youth in a holistic manner, and lead the space with some information or some strategies for accessing local and national resources to promote youth mental health. Here are our lovely presenters at the top. Unfortunately, Ms. Ty Courtney is unable to join us today. She had a family emergency, and so we please do send love and prayers of positivity and comfort in her direction. Um, but if you want to learn more about the incredible work she's doing with Valley After Dark, please use the links that will go into the chat box. Um, and then we will, after Dr. Abdul Adil has some time to talk a little bit about his work, we'll have a bit of a discussion and Q&A facilitated by myself and Dr. Dana Cunningham to round out our conversation today. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Abdul Adil to introduce himself. Thank you very much and I appreciate you inviting me. I'm just highlighting a few things on this lens. We are representing the Urban Youth Trauma Center and my particular program, Hip Hop Heals, which started off in Chicago a long time ago in Cabrini Green, for those of you who may uh, remember that way back in the day, and it has grown since then to absorb trauma-informed work as well. I'm very happy to be part of the National Child Traumatic Stress Network and also to meet this illustrious group that we'll, I'll be presenting to today. And some of the things as part of my lens that actually inform this work have to do with my faith, the, the um, inspiration to always be resilient no matter what obstacles we're facing, which also comes out in how we present a mental health perspective, uh, having my own children, and we're wanting to treat other people's children as if they are my own and how I hope someone would treat them. It includes being a Howard University HBCU grad, a very proud one at that, because education has always been about mission. It was never a mission just to get an education. And I once wrote for the Chicago Sun-Times and rap music. And that really was an opportunity to look at it from an industry perspective, as well as a mental health perspective to go along with the youth perspective. So I try to integrate those lenses in ways that we can actually leverage these lyrics for positive mental health. And I think with that, I would like to share my screen um, and we will dive right into it. Okay, great. And we have just covered that part. So I'll dive right into rap music and hip hop culture. So I look at rap music as music, which can be medicine. And if you look at this picture here, which reflects the art that for a lot of young people is a pro-social means of expression that often is self-soothing as well as motivation to be able to make it through school and some of the other challenges which happen. You'll see something about this picture in addition to it being just a nice picture and reflection of youth talent. You'll see lots of faces. So when you're using rap and hip hop, you draw from not just rap music, but hip hop culture, which I'll touch on in the next. And that world today, you have many choices. You'll see some classical choices from people old school, and don't you feel old when I say this, but old school, if you listen to it, like Queen Latifah, Public Enemy, Salt and Pepper, Eric B and Rakim and KRS-One, 
There's that next era of artists who came along, like the famous Lauryn Hill, Eminem, Nas, and Jay-Z. Some of the newer artists like J. Cole, Nicki Minaj, Kendrick Lamar, Lizzo, and Drake. And we definitely use here in Chicago artists from the area like Twista, Common, DeBrat, Lupe Fiasco, Chance the Rapper, and Polo G. The key point is to find your own lane to leverage the lyrics. And let me say off the top, Rap music contains both the best and the worst of youth behavior. The best and the worst of youth behavior. Just like the world represents the best and the worst of what humanity can be. And if I want to be frank, which I usually am, psychology can be your best friend or your worst enemy, depending on your relationship to these institutions, right? So when we're looking at rap music and hip hop culture. We're not looking at it to glorify it. We're looking at it to leverage it, to strategically select those songs, videos, and related materials in the news, on YouTube, and other areas that can illustrate, that can motivate, that can engage our young people and deliver those same pro-social messages that we traditionally deliver through lectures and leaflets, right? So the program I have, Hip Hop Heals, is designed to identify those strategically selected, let me underscore, strategically selected songs and artists which can amplify pro-social messages while also critiquing some of the negative messages which are out in the media, including but beyond rap music, just out in our world. And it's having an engaging edutainment type conversation where you not only engage, but you also educate. And that is the objective of using this type of approach. Now, when we talk about hip hop culture, which is beyond inclusive, but beyond just rap music, we're talking about the five original elements. And this, of course, I'm going to own also, I should have put on that lens slide. I'm a historian, so I like to keep it real. And there are five original elements that comprise hip hop culture. It started off with the MC, of course. Actually, what came before that was the DJ, right? The one who played the music. Then the MCs would be the ones who would rhyme along. Then you have the breakers. When they were changing records back in the old days, you'd have to entertain the crowd so you don't lose the energy of the party or the event. So you'd have break dancers. Like the break in the action, that's where you get the terms B-boys and B-girls back in the old days. There was also beatboxing. And finally, there's graffiti. And so each of these elements represent an arts-focused, strengths-oriented approach to youth development. You have young people who can be engaged and encouraged to use their verbal skills, to use their music making skills, to use their dancing skills, to use even their beatboxing skills. You don't even need equipment to beatbox, right? Human percussion, and also to use their art skills like you saw in the original picture. So if you think about it, it's a broad-based arts-inspired curriculum. You have many different talents that your young people may be able to tap into and leverage also through school curricula, through after-school activities, but also li then linking to pro-social activities in the community. So there's that real artistic wraparound from the school to after school, to community, to things they could do at home. And nowadays with the technology, it's a lot easier to engage across all of this between, you know, what do they have all these apps? They got Canva, they got music making, they got beatbox, they got all this stuff and you can share on social media. So there's a great potential for us to use these activities to inspire and educate and motivate inside school as well as outside school. Now, when we talk about mental health programming, my program is called Hip Hop Heals. Hip Hop Heals is actually that, that hip hop used appropriately can be a healing mechanism in trauma-informed approaches. My particular emphasis is on community violence, child trauma, gang involvement, gun violence, and a myriad of other issues which are chronic, entrenched, and I also want to acknowledge are historic. So. Dealing with a community which I primarily deal with racial, ethnic, religious, and linguistic minorities, they operate out of a historic prism of being marginalized, of being devalued, and being able to tap into an endeavor, a hobby that they're actually encouraged by, 
that they actually feel is theirs. That's their language, you know, their lyrics, their way of being is a great way of engaging them to meet them where they are, to get them where they need to go. And when you ask, where do we want them to go? Toward those very same research and scholarly substantiated best practices that have to do with trauma, that have to do with violence prevention and intervention, that have to do with uh, psychosocial development, that have to do with social skills, but we're presenting and packaging these models in a language with relevant examples, as well as motivational presentations, so they're more likely to absorb it, take it, and work with it. In particular, and I can go into more detail on this, so you can actually check things on our webpage, we have a program which is actually a manualized violence prevention and intervention program in our prevention realm. And we have a hip hop heels version, which is actually based on a traditional family systems approach. It's just laced with this cultural context and these exemplars for discussion and illustration. So when you say, what's the root of this? You could look at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the World Health Organization, all of the family systems, family therapy, structural, strategic, and systemic approaches, also solution focused, and a lot of other traditional science substantiated approaches. But it's laced together in such a way, and it's not a lecture, it's actually edutainment for learning. And our young people are more likely to engage in those discussions than sit in a lecture. And you know, as someone who has three kids, I can certainly attest to the fact that one thing an adolescent does not want more of is lecturing. So I thought I would invite some guest presenters or some guest speakers, if you will. And for the first, for the uh, major part of the rest of the presentation, I'm going to play little samples of what I'm talking about, right? Um, so this first one, since this is a school-oriented group, I wanted to play something that actually is school teachers. This is an example of school teachers who, when we were in the midst of the pandemic and they were launching their virtual school, they made a rap and hip hop introduction and orientation to their classroom, which really speaks for itself. And so I'll play a little clip of this now. Miss Evans on the beat, so tap in. Yeah, you got options, but you better pass my class, no flopping. Gonna log in every day, every morning I'm watching. Yeah, we virtual and you know it's up, so we about to take it up a notch. Yeah, my role is to I'm still in thing. shock every time I hear this and I see this. It's just uh, such good quality there. Their video has been shared all across the and globe. This is a new, all new at six. WCNC Charlotte's Ruby Durham talked to the teachers about their newfound fame. What's poppin'? Brand new year and I'm locked in. Far as this teaching go, I am unreachable. I'm number one in your top Let's team. Miss Williams. It's back to school time and thousands are tapping into this viral rap and dance video. Two teachers made to Jack Harlow's song, What's Poppin'? So I'll stop that there. And a couple things to note. One, a lot of rapping, a lot of dancing, while delivering very clear instructions on this COVID classroom viral format. Motivational, you see also, these are teachers who are affiliated with the local cheerleading squad that's in the school. So you can see how easily you can engage youth in pro-social productive school successful activities that include not only in school, but after school activities and is presented and is engaged in a way that represents their artistic way of being. Sets a very positive tone for a very difficult time having to do with the pandemic and having a virtual classroom. And when kids were already suffering and struggling, as these teachers said, their motivation was to uplift the students, make them feel good about participating in a virtual format that they may not have, and to engage them where they are so they could feel like their worldviews, their hobbies, their culture, their activities are being affirmed within the classroom to, to build up uh, uh, educational momentum, even though it was a virtual format. So I say, as I leave that also, that some of us have some hidden talent. And some of us may have even been raised on certain brands or genres of rap that we can tap into to engage our youth, not only in mental health, but also in the scholastic activities. Now, I'll move ahead to some of the pro professional rappers. Um, and this is a song called I Can. It's kind of, uh, uh, I call it like it's kind of quasi-classical. It, it's uh, older, but it's still relevant. And actually this 
became an anthem for African-American history, pride and empowerment, not only in Black History Month, but also for graduations. And many schools use this. This was a very uplifting song and it builds off and you'll see the elements of rap and hip hop culture. And it builds off the I can by emphasizing issues of resilience, issues of scholastic success, and issues of avoiding some of the traps or distractions which have impeded mental health and educational performance. And we'll play a brief clip of this. Okay. If you can see from that brief clip, there are many issues of upliftment, of resiliency, of you can even put this into perspective when you're dealing with uh, folks who survived trauma, transformative trauma experiences. It's a lot of that. And the pride and the empowerment was something that resonates, especially with youth who feel they need to be affirmed. You think about, I know I can. Not I think I can. Not, I don't know if I can. I hope I can. It's like, no, I know I can be what I want to be. You know, and that conviction is inspirational and it's coming from Nas, who's a very well-respected rap artist, giving some of the same uplifting messages that we do. A little side note on this before we leave, Nas made a specific song, this one, for his daughter. And his reasoning was she needs that same type of encouragement and so much of the music that he had made may not have been a clear kind of triumphant message. So he dedicated this song to her, but it quickly went viral, as we say. It became an anthem, not just in grade schools and high schools, but at colleges and universities. It's very, very inspirational. And it was very strong about resilience. Now we'll move to the next video example, which is Lynn manuel Miranda. And it's the song, Wrote My Way Out. Now, I wrote my way out. Uh, has many elements. I'm just going to play you a brief clip. Keep in mind that some of these young people perceive themselves to be poets and artists who are creatively describing their environment and their struggles within. And the link to this, for those of you uh, who've already seen Hamilton or who have heard of it, this is a link to the whole art where you can start off being inspired by rap, but you can succeed in school, Broadway, you know, from street corners to the suites, as they say, and in, in areas where people would not necessarily expect rap music to permeate and to succeed. And for those of you who saw his Saturday Night Live monologue, I still think that's one of the most brilliant performances of a Saturday Night Live opening that I've ever seen. But we'll focus right now on Rope My Way Out. And again, you hear these themes of resiliency, of almost a defiance in the face of oppression or difficult conditions. And I wrote my way out. So I'm picking up the pen, which is definitely one of the key symbols, <laughs> as well as instruments when you're in school and you're writing your way out. And th the whole song is excellent. Some of those uh, words that were dropped just in those verses we touched on, you heard him dealing with bullying, dealing with being teased for doing well in school because he was reading, going back to the parent who's doing the best they can to provide support and guidance and advice, and just continuing to move forward, including affirming his ethnic background as a proud Puerto Rican, right? So many themes in there. And again, you could then have more conversations about what's the young person's gift who's, who's in front of you. Maybe they rap, maybe they make music, maybe they write plays, maybe they're good at English. You know, maybe they've been bullied. Uh, maybe they, you know, they've struggled with reading or maybe they're exceptional readers and they kind of keep it quiet because they don't want to get bullied. It opens the door for a lot of conversations that you can have. And I want to go now to the last video, which is by Little Dirk with the assistance of J. Cole, and it's called All My Life. And this is one of my recent ones. I usually use them across the eras because it's just a wealth of information. And trust me, you all can use older ones if you combine them with the newer ones. And a lot of times our young people, they're really surprised and they appreciate the older videos and songs they may not know if you if you could bring it up, especially stuff you used to listen to if you're older than them. But on this particular one, I wanted to bring this because I know there's this term and there's this genre out there called gangster rap. Right. 
misogyny, violence, and all of these. And some of that's true, which is why you strategically select. But you can also strategically select a so-called gangster rapper who's making a pro-social conscious song. So some gangster rappers make conscious songs. And some constituencies, some of our young people, they will identify more with a positive song coming from a gangster rapper than they would someone who's known for being more conscious because that's just not their favorite artist. And some of our young people appreciate someone who keeps it real and who will say things in a more raw fashion, even when it's positive, because they feel like they have come from more of those lived experiences that they have. So some of my gang involve youth, they will listen to Little Dirk before they listen to a Chance the Rapper. They may have heard of Queen Latifah, but they may be more motivated by a Nicki Minaj or a Cardi B. So you strategically select the artist and the song which reflects the sensibilities of your audience, while you also make sure you strategically select those songs that are saying something you actually want them to hear or that's reinforcing your message. So let me play this by this gangster rapper who's making a conscious song. And I'll tell you a little story about this as we wind up once you've seen it. A few things. It's very powerful. A couple of things. One, I never thought I'd make it out. You hear about hear the words and, and think about the conversation you can have with young people, how much that reflects their sensibilities. All my life trying to keep me down, but they couldn't break me, right? these themes of resilience. Also, Little Dirt, as someone who's actually been involved in some very high-risk behavior, but is now trying to make a positive pivot, is an important role model that you can make changes even if you feel like you're entrenched in a way that you can't escape. And that's a very powerful conversation, especially with Little Dirt being a very popular artist. And here in Chicago, you know, he's very, he's been, he had a history of gang involvement. Chicago is definitely a gang city, but he's speaking to his constituencies in a way that's motivating for them. Also, for those of you who may not know, Little Dirk's dad was a central figure in the Gangster Disciples when they were very huge in Chicago, and they still are. He's now come out of prison and is a very strong community mentor doing pro-social work. So Little Dirk, there's a big Dirk. See, and you can link that to how family can help you. And the help didn't start when he got out of prison. Guess when? It helped when he was inside. And he was telling his son he needs to change his ways not to end up like him. And he was making changes inside that didn't have ramifications outside. And now they have all types of charity work that they do on the south side of Chicago. All of this is, is with the assistance and the influence of hip hop, right? A couple other things. This goes beyond the intended audience sometimes. There, this song was so inspirational. There was a homeless person in Los Angeles. This was in the news. His name was Pedro Ramirez. Homeless person in Los Angeles. And those of you out in Los Angeles, as you know, homelessness is a problem, right? Um, he was streaming his song on TikTok on a TV projector in his tent. Little Dirk found out about this, made a surprise visit to him, and gave him various gifts, which included a hotel room for 30 days, a new phone, a gift card, and some spending money. So some of the gangster rappers can make positive songs and have positive community influences, including working with schools. So I know we want to get to our Q&A, so I'll just wrap this up in this way by saying, <laughs> I'll drop the mic and I'll pass it along. And thank you. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Abdul Deal. That was great uh, information. Really appreciate uh, the focus on thinking about how we can really use music and hip hop music in particular to really help empower youth, engage them, have uh, wonderful discussions and really connect to their experiences. Um, so let me pull back up our slides and we can move into our Q&A. 
Um, all right, so we have a few questions for um, Dr. Abdul Deal, and if you all have questions as well for him, please do share those in the Q&A pod so we can uh, keep track of those. Uh, that would be great. So our first question, uh, Dr. Abdul Deal, we're uh, really thinking about um, holistic approaches. We spent a lot of time talking about the use of music. Uh, why are these holistic approaches to healing important when we think about the different ways that we can support youth? Well, I think we want to help them self-actualize, right? To maximize their choices and chances. So we want to develop all aspects of them. So in our program, we talk about the mental, the physical, and the spiritual growth in relation to doing right by yourself, by your family, by society, by the world. Also, we have to break through some of the historic obstacles. This includes the historical traumas of racism, sexism, discrimination, oppression, and their modern manifestations which include inferior educational opportunities and resources, negative mental health outcomes. These things play themselves out stuff like mass incarceration, supremacist uh, uh, attacks, and a whole bunch of other issues which go on. And in the schools, it can be an assault on your psyche. If you don't see yourself, connect yourself, if you're not ex exposed to positive models, your positive history, this can set you off on a destructive course, even if the person or the system doesn't intend to send you that way. So building up all those ways are important, which is why the I Can and the Hamilton videos show how youth can soothe themselves. They can protect their identities through their artistic pursuits. They can even make these pursuits a career themselves. And I think Lin-Manuel Miranda, Little Dirk, and others examples who use rap, dance, theater, television, and other pursuits. And you can affirm your ethnic pride and history while also finding your lane out in society. And you need all of that. Because <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's, there's multiple risk factors which are going on, especially with the young people I deal with uh, in Chicago. Uh, and we should mention, I am a very proud HBCU graduate from Howard who had the pleasure of going to Baltimore and also some of the places you all are. I've, I've gone to many urban areas and I appreciate and find strength in all of them. Yes, yes, we're so glad uh, that uh, there's so, our communities have so much to offer us, and um, it's just so important to be able to engage with them. Uh, you mentioned kind of really the power of taking this holistic approach, and unfortunately, how schools um, sometimes engage in practices that are harmful to our young people. Um, and in many of our well-meaning efforts, we often utilize uh, sort of traditional talk therapy methods to try to support you. Um, and I think there's also, as we're talking today, lots of room to utilize other approaches as well that can also be very beneficial. Uh, so can you take a moment to talk to us about what are some of the limitations that you find, uh, particularly when we think about trying to reach um, youth today, uh, thinking about particularly urban youth, or rural youth, or the power of um, all these other mediums that are being pulled, that youth are sort of being drawn to, whether it be things on social media or TikTok or music, right? Um, dance, how, uh, what are maybe some of the limitations of traditional uh, approaches to mental health um, that you see in your work? Uh, that's a very good question. And I want to say that traditions, quote unquote, that are not rooted in the historic and contemporary cultural traditions of the youth families and communities themselves, those are not traditions, those are impositions, impositions. So we can build off the best general approaches and then we can adapt and enrich them through local cultural context, the community providers, the stakeholders, the youth themselves, right? Those are the resources that are necessary to really go beyond the traditional box and limitations to extend and connect to people's actual lifestyles and the way they view things. You know, as demonstrated in the teacher's rap video, uh, that was a very creatively constructed, culturally sensitive and contextually relevant method of discussing virtual online learning. Now we could have handed out, uh, you know, uh, leaflets. <laughs> we we could have given an announcement. They put it in the language that engaged and motivated. So I think if they would have stuck with a traditional approach, I'm not sure they'd have had all those kids behind them dancing so energetically. I'm not sure that would have went viral. Um, and so it talks about the power of meeting the young people where they are to get them where they need to go. And again, using rap and hip hop culture across the range of the elements extends beyond what are the limits of those traditional approaches. 
In addition, there are many indigenous healing ways, indigenous healers, cultural traditions that must be respected and incorporated into our traditional approaches. And if need be, I guess I have to just go ahead and say, sometimes we have to restructure our traditional approaches or maybe even reject those traditional approaches which are otherwise not helpful because the goal is to be helpful, not harmful. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Dual-Deal. I'm really um, sitting with your reference to our impositions that are placed on uh, young people if we are not taking into uh, consideration their culture, um, their identity, um, and making sure that we are being culturally responsive in the work that we are doing. All right, let me go to our next question. Um, so what approaches would you recommend that we utilize to identify and um, harness the strengths of young people? How can we uh, do this work ourselves um, and really try to bring out the, the strengths of the young people that we're working with? And we also want to encourage the audience, uh, please share your thoughts in the chat box with us. What are things that you do to uplift the strengths of the youth that you work with? And thank you for underscoring the chat box, because I do think this is a collaborative learning experience we have here. And I'm sure with 200, almost 200 people. Those strengths focused assessments and community linked resources. Um, what we're trying to do is identify what what's a person's passion and what can project them forward. So I always like to ask, what are you good at? Uh, what would you like people to know about you that most people don't know about you, especially at school, for example? So there might be some kids, and I've had them, they come in, they've got this disruptive behavior diagnosis, they've been arrested four or five times, they're in and out of juvenile detention, or they're mouthing off in class, or they're drifting off, they're doing this, they're doing that. It's like a, it's like a scroll of problems. From a strength-based perspective, we'd still say, and what are you good at? In the hip-hop heels, we say, what's your gift? And we frame it as gift because we're saying it's not just something that you're good at, it's something that's unique to you because there's no one else like you. What are you good at? It might be rapping. It might be dancing. It could be drawing. It could be taking care of a sibling. It could be you know, contributing things to the community. It could be stopping by talking to the elderly person who nobody you know, stops and talks. It could be anything, but it's a strength. And it's a start. So we like to ask them, what are you good at? Or what would you like people to know about you that most people don't or most people won't acknowledge? And from there, it can lead to strengths-based discussions throughout treatment or throughout the prevention programs to get them to continue to look at things in a balanced perspective. Notice does not mean everything is easy. There's no magic pills, no magic wands, especially when you're working in urban environments where there's been generations of chronic problems and intergenerational trauma itself. But shifting the lens allows things to open up. And I think systematically doing that at the assessment level, then secondly, asking them what type of things do you do after school? Who do you do it with? Where might you go? Are there people, you know, who you like to kick it with? And yo, know, there might be some people you like to kick it with, it might be gang members. All right. All right. Well, are there other people you talk to? Are there times when you've been around your gang members who you're not out shooting or you're not doing things that get you in trouble? Oh, we play Nintendo. We, what are they playing these days? We, you know, and all these. Find something to break the chronic cycle of this one negative thing after another. And I think that's a structured form of assessment that's very important. And if you look at the video uh, I wrote my way out that I had there, their experiences in school that they were able to identify things that they like. So even when, for example, that character was talking about being bullied in school, they also talk about picking up the pen in school. You saw some of those characters, they're even when they're sitting by themselves in school, they're writing, they're rhymes, right? Some of them are playing sports. You saw also the sports theme and I can. So you're looking systematically for areas of strength, which include within school, but also out in community, and it includes arts as well as other things. Thanks so much. So important to focus on strengths. We tend to be very problem focused as a profession, and so really important to think about and identify strengths when we are working with our young people and families. Uh, Dr. Patterson, what are you seeing in the chat box? What are folks sharing with us? 
Yes, we're seeing a lot of great feedback. Um, Dr. Abdul Adil, I appreciate some of those really concrete examples of kind of identifying new strengths and just finding opportunities to elevate um, what we're seeing young people are into. Um, there are some comments here, especially around building relationship as building relationship, building rapport is central to being able to potentially understand, identify, and help to elevate the strengths of young people. Um, also seeing folks talking about having young people themselves identify the emotions that they're experiencing while engaging in something that is clearly a preferred activity. That is a key way of helping not only the adults kind of see the strengths of that individual, but that youth understanding this is something unique and special about me. And it's something I can tap into if I want to revisit that positive emotion, whatever they would label it as, such as excitement or happiness. Um, I see also a lot of attention to just being observant. There is so much that we, in a biased way, can attend to, especially in spaces where there's a lot of demand placed on adults in the space. It's easier to pay attention to disruptive situations or incidences that cause challenge. But when we observe closely with intention to look for the strengths, the good moments, catching young people being good, they're showing what is unique to them, what their assets are all the time. You just have to attend to it. So I'm seeing a lot of comments around that here. And it's specifically around sources of strength. Yes, of course. Just, and something on that note, especially out of the little Dirk all my life, he talked about he knows there's some kids who might want to hurt themselves. And see, he speaks to that. He gives it as as a person. He gives it a language and an example. And that's when he did like this in the video. He said, "I know some kids want to hurt themselves." And he said, "Heal yourself, just like I heal myself." And he says something which can be maybe even provocative for us as as uh, service providers. But he said, "I referred myself." So it wasn't that some psychologist or a clinical social worker or someone or school counselor came and found them and dragged them to treatment is this person recognized i need to do better i need to take care of myself i'm gonna stop self-medicating he mentioned with the substances he said i referred myself meaning i came and sought help and that breaks that stigma of health of of help seeking especially in some of our uh young people who might otherwise not trust or not feel a connection to mainstream health services so you see how the, the, the songs are not preachy, but they're powerful. Now, if I gave them a big, long lecture about, you know, you should go get help from the mainstream and you shouldn't do that to yourself, they may tune me out. But you say, little Dirk did that and he mentioned this, I can talk about that verse. And that's reaching people who otherwise may not be reached by our mainstream health system. So I'm just, I just wanted to make sure that was mentioned because when kids can at least label what they're going through, even if they don't have the, the uh, psycho speak language to know that they need some help and then we can give them that help. And in a way that's embracing where they are, wherever, wherever they are when they first walk in, that's a very powerful chance for us to kind of break some of these cycles. Awesome, all right, well, let's move to our next question. I know we are um, moving a little close to time. So as we um, think about our audience today, uh, Dr. Abdul Deal, what steps uh, would you recommend that folks take to identify local and national resources to promote holistic youth mental health? I have seen a few questions about folks thinking about uh, working in rural areas or other places. Uh, what kind of recommendations would you make to help um, our audience today identify resources they can utilize? Good point here to look locally while you're thinking globally and think globally, look locally. And there's plenty uh, in my experience. I have never gone into a community that does not have leaders, advocates and strengths. So I like tapping into through a collaborative treatment planning approach, find out what's going on in communities. They may not be famous. They may not be little Dirk, you know, uh, or Lynn manuel Miranda, but they are making a difference. And they may be flying under the radar. So I would definitely do a community-based needs assessment about what resources are available. I would also look for some creative as well as traditional approaches to mental health because there are some of these groups. I mean, I work with some of the groups who are around the country who they're building off the mental health framework, but they're adding in these arts 
you know, there's there's a uh, I'm very happy to say one of my partners in Toledo is almost 80 years old and she's a former rapper and breakdance and she'll tell you she still raps in breakdance probably could, could still do it. Um, so there, there are plenty of resources that we should look around for. I think one other thing I want to underscore is I want to look I would encourage us look in the native language and community stakeholders of particular bilingual groups because there are plenty of people who may not make it on the english radar but they're very strong in their own communities we can build bridges to those communities we should actually partner and try to promote and elevate those voices that otherwise are left out of mainstream services in this particular society which is very english centric and there are cultural ways of healing that they're doing that sometimes can amplify what we're doing or sometimes even do a little bit better than what we could do alone and i'd want to make sure that um I reached out to them and also look around at colleagues. You know, I'm sure this talent that these teachers who rapped, uh, people may not have known they could they could roll like that, but they did a pretty good job. You know, I don't want to say as amateurs, but even not as amateurs, it's a pretty good job at describing, you know, a viral school platform. And so you might find colleagues who can partner with you that you all can work together creatively um, to provide some more culturally sensitive arts grounded services. Wonderful. Thank you so much for those suggestions. Just a reminder for folks that there is a link in the chat box for the evaluation. So before you leave today, please do remember to complete that. Um, and also think about there is so much strength uh, within our communities, within ourselves as individuals and our colleagues. Uh, again, we want to kind of think about and harness those strengths as we uh, think about doing this work and connect with each other. Sometimes schools and communities are so um, just separate from each other. And there's so much that both can offer uh, if we come together and work collaboratively. Um, so it's really important to do that community-based needs assessment to find out what is right there within your backyard uh, that can be utilized to support our young people. All right, so um, we can see if anyone has other questions in the chat box, uh, please do feel free to add those in. We do have um, just a few more moments. I'm seeing a lot of conversation in the chat box. People are really appreciating uh, this conversation. Oops. Um, didn't mean to do that. Uh, if you also, though, have resources or information to share about things within your community um, that you would like to share um, and let us know what's happening, please do share those resources in the chat box. I do see a question about any pop culture role models in Indigenous communities that you are aware of. Um, Dr. Abdul, do you have any recommendations or thoughts? Actually, there are a number of Native American rap artists. I almost want to ask that person, please email me. I'll give you a list. But I actually have a section of my playlist, which are uh, some of the artists who are taking some very powerful pro-social perspectives about life, both, as they say, on the res and off the res, and the bridge between them to protect your cultural heritage. Okay, so You awesome. can email me. I'll send them out. Thank you. And I see someone share in the chat box. Uh, is it Sepa man, maybe out of Montana saying he has some good, uh, uh, I'm not sure he or she uh, has good videos. Uh, and then there's a question about the curriculum you presented. I know you mentioned your website earlier. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and where we can find it? Uh, yes, that's at the Urban Youth Trauma Center at the University of Illinois, Chicago, and we have our five best practices as trauma-informed violence prevention and intervention. Very quickly, it's support survivors of trauma, connecting to healthy relationships with peers and adults, finding your gift, number three, um, finding a sense of mental, emotional, and physical safety, number four, and number five is changing cultural norms, including the norms which produce use violence that's not exclusive to young people uh, nor any particular community in a society which we still glorify guns and violence. So being able to critique that and recognize that uh, is very important part of this. 
All right, thank you. It sounds like a great resource. I see that has been shared in the chat box as well. And it's Superman, like Superman. Uh, so thanks for that uh, clarification. Awesome. This has been such a wonderful conversation. We never have enough time uh, with our presenters. Uh, we just thank you so much, Dr. Abdul Dill, for sharing your wisdom and insight with us today. Uh, we will share a few resources with you um, here that you can access. And um, again, please remember to complete the evaluation or receive your certificate of attendance. The slides and this recording will be shared on the skillmentalhealth.org website within about a week's time. So you can find it there, share it with your colleagues, and you may want to go back and listen uh, again to some of the wisdom that was shared today. Uh, we thank you all so much for your time and participation, and we look forward to seeing you uh, next month for our next virtual learning series. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for having me.